to go back and look at that. And that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord, and it and it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. And later in 25 says, Blessed be my people, Egypt. This uh, altar in the midst of the land of Egypt and the pillar at the border, I believe, and many scholars concur, is none other than the pyramid. For according to the reference books, it seems to indicate that the pyramid is in the middle at the border thereof. It is serving as a symbol, an emblem, or a sign. And relation to what we have learned from uh, about the Giza Plateau being a power uh, plant, uh, I talk with uh, my friend Stephen about this, that I think that there is more yet to this subject uh, that Christopher was bringing out about the power plant concept of the pyramid. I think he's right on this. But I also believe that we being biological batteries ourselves, we are a, an electrical unit of sorts ourselves. Our very thoughts are and can be considered to be in the virtual state uh, I think that there's something going on here on an even higher level with humans and that pyramid. I think that there is some sort of a resonant frequency in humans to somehow or another affect us, probably to open our minds or to open our spirits, uh, so that while we may be talking about a very mundane thing of of an electrical power plant, we're also talking about something that very well might be a sign or a symbol, which is an opening uh, for us to move into a different uh, dimension, perhaps. I hold all of these things as a very good possibility. <coughs> In relation to the millennium, which is about to begin, we're told, the Old Testament and the New Testament talk about the concept of a Messiah. And in the Old Testament, and the book of Psalms, for instance, is one of the three places where the Messiah is referred to as a symbol. There's an interesting symbol used in the Old Testament Hebrew for the Messiah. The same identical symbol is used in the New Testament for Jesus, the Messiah. Let me read it to you. And then I also want to talk about the whole concept of Messiah and, and its implications for our time, the Messianic era. But in the book of Psalms 118, the Hebrew Old Testament, Psalms 118.22 says... The stone which the builders rejected is become the chief cornerstone. And this is from the Lord and is his doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It was talking about the Messiah, and again, the Messiah is referred to as the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Over in the New Testament, one of the many places in the New Testament that the uh, Messiah is referred to by the same symbol. In 1 Peter 2.6, the scripture says, Wherefore it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone. The builders rejected. The reference works show, and again, there's at least three different places in the New Testament where Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone, the builders rejected. In the Old Testament, Messiah is the chief cornerstone. <clears throat> An interesting fact about this is that the word in Hebrew for chief cornerstone and Greek in the New Testament chief cornerstone simply means a triangle or a pyramidion 
triangle perched on top of a pyramid. That is what the word chief cornerstone <coughs> in the, both the Hebrew and the Greek actually means. So the symbol for the Messiah in both the Old Testament and the New is the triangle or the capstone of the pyramid. Now we're talking Egypt. Now we're talking this ancient land. We're not talking about Rome. We're not talking about the West. We're talking about the East. The sun always rises in the East. Light comes into the world from the East, not the West. The reference works show that the <clears throat> chief cornerstone, meaning the top angle of a pyramid, here Jesus Christ himself is acknowledged as the chief cornerstone. The Expositor's Bible Commentary says that the Greek word for chief cornerstone means, quote, the tip of the angle. Here in Ephesians, it says in the book of Ephesians, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Uh, the footnotes has the triangle perched on the pyramid. Uh, a pyramid, pyramidion, uh, is, of course, the little pyramid perched to finish off the big pyramid. Now, the point I wish to make is that this is a very important symbol, and it has profound implications for the symbolism that's being uh, uh, bandied around in America. On the back of the $1 bill, you will see the, uh, uh, the pyramid with the all-seeing eye, Let's see, where is it? I had a... Anyway, we had a picture of the uh, pyramid. Here it is. Of course, the uh, triangle at the top being, as I said, the symbol for the Messiah, you need to understand also that while this might be esoteric Christianity or esoteric Judaism, it is also well understood in political circles throughout the world and that uh, so much of the elite establishment of world government throughout the world is well aware of the implications of this ancient land and its symbols in the pyramid. Uh, so much so that the most important people in the world are coming here to celebrate something called a new millennium. What has occurred to me, a question which I have, uh, I have asked many times is does the new millennium about to dawn begin the thousand-year reign of Christ, or does the thousand-year reign of Christ begin the new millennium? In other words, according to the Christian tradition, if Jesus is to come back and bring a kingdom, and when he comes back, it will inaugurate a new order or a thousand-year reign of Christ, then does Christ or Jesus have to wait until the calendar date of the new millennium beginning? Why couldn't he come back uh, ten years ago? Why can't he uh, come back a hundred years ago? Because the concept is that the Lord Master coming back begins his thousand-year reign, then whenever he comes back, that begins his thousand-year reign. Or, as the churches in Christendom throughout the world are saying, that the new millennium will begin the reign of Christ. It will begin the new reign of the Messiah. Because if the churches are correct, then what we're talking about is an astronomical event, not a literal Messiah coming back. We're talking about a calendar event. But this Messiah cannot come back until we have a celebration. We have to have the celebration. It has to be on the calendar, and it has to be at the end of the, the thousand-year period to inaugurate a new thousand-year period. Now the Messiah can come back. He can't come back before. 
Do you understand the point I'm making? Which is which? Does the thousand year reign begin when the Messiah comes back? Or does the Messiah come back when the thousand year begins? The point is, is that the second answer is the correct one. The Messiah is an astrological, astronomical term. And that the entire concept and even the old Hebrew tradition of the Messiah was a period of time, a messianic era, a time that would come. Uh, and I am respectfully suggesting that unless and until we get our stuff together, uh, spiritually speaking, that messianic era is long yet away from us. Because I don't believe that on this planet we are ready for a messianic era. We haven't even learned how to live with each other, much less live with that divine one who created us. We are in total disarray before our God. It's interesting that uh, the symbol of the triangle has been used uh, all over the world, politically speaking. It's um, an interesting subject which I have been working on for many years, is the occult or hidden connection between the triangle and the circle and the new dawn, or the coming new dawn, of which Aleister Crowley was merely one of many who realized the implications of the subject of the new dawn. If you will go back in your history books, and uh, when the Soviet Union was still in existence, you will see that the Soviet National Coat of Arms had a sun rising over the earth with the hammer and sickle and the red star. The hammer and the sickle, incidentally, were separate symbols for thousands of years, and they were only brought together by the communists to cross them. The sickle was always a symbol of Saturn. The Saturnalian symbol, or the symbol for the planet Saturn, astronomically, was an upside-down sickle, okay, surmounted by a cross. Rather interesting, I suspect. The symbol of the sickle being Saturn's symbol, the Saturnalian symbol of the planet Saturn, surmounted by the cross, and the hammer being the hammer on the ancient world was the axe. It became known as the hammer, the hammer of Thor, the symbol for the ability of the gods to tear down, smash down with the hammer, and to build up with power. So those two symbols were crossed in the communist world. Um, there's a whole story on the planet Saturn and its connections to the Nazi philosophy, the Nazi religious philosophy, the communist philosophy, the fascist, uh, it is a fascinating story about how the planet Saturn has influenced both governments and religions uh, throughout thousands and thousands of years. Symbols. Uh, re re reminds me, what is the one symbol that was most prominent besides the swastika in Nazi Germany and in Nazi-occupied Europe. The one symbol that was most used and is most reprehensible to anyone who hated that system was a fasci, the symbol of world fascism. The symbol of world fascism, or the fasci, is a bundle of sticks with uh, crisscrossed with a hatchet head. A bundle of sticks with a hatchet head is the symbol of world fascism. It's called a fasci. You will see on the nightly news in America, every night on C-SPAN, almost every night in America you will see in the congressional room, altar in the midst of the land of Egypt and the pillar at the border, I believe, and many 
scholars concur, is none other than the pyramid. For according to the reference books, it seems to indicate that the pyramid is in the middle, at the border thereof. It is serving as a symbol, an emblem, or a sign. I'm going to go back and look at that. And that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord, and it and it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. And later in 25 says, Blessed be my people, Egypt. This, uh, and relation to what we have learned from uh, about the Giza Plateau being a power uh, plant, uh, I talk with uh, my friend Stephen about this, that I think that there's more yet to the subject uh, that Christopher was bringing out about the power plant concept of the pyramid. I think he's right on this. But I also believe that we being biological batteries ourselves, we are a, an electrical unit of sorts ourselves, our very thoughts are and can be considered to be in the virtual state. Um, I think that there's something going on here on an even higher level with humans and that pyramid. I think that there is some sort of a resonant frequency in humans to somehow or another affect us, probably to open our minds or to open our spirits, uh, so that while we may be talking about a very mundane thing of, of an electrical power plant, we're also 